All right, why don't we go ahead and get started. So thank you guys for joining Mark Lamonica. I look after the individual investor team here in Sydney. So I'm joined today by Angus and Matt. We'll get to them and introduce them in one second. But first, go through a couple of housekeeping items. So number one, anything you hear today is general advice. We don't know anything about you, so we can't offer personal advice. The other thing is that if you are over in New Zealand, you can get a copy of our FAP on our website, morningstar.com.au. And the New Zealand regulatory authorities would like you to reach out to a financial advisor if you would like personal advice. All right, there we go. There's the introduction. The other thing, of course, is this is a great opportunity to ask questions. So if you have questions for Matt or Angus, just send them through at any time. We'll go through a little bit of an introduction that we can get into those questions. So I'm going to put up their coverage universe once again. And the obvious thing looking at this is that Angus works a lot harder than Matt. Look at how many different companies he covers compared to Matt. But I'll introduce them. I'll let them introduce themselves and talk a little bit at a high level of the different companies they cover. So why don't we start with Matt? So Matt runs our equity research team here in Sydney. And yeah, you want to tell us a little bit about yourself and, and your coverage? What an introduction, Mark. So you're going to make me work <laughs> for my supper. <laughs> so Exactly, exactly. Um, I actually feel like I do a lot of work. So um, I, I, head, <laughs> I head up the team. So Adam Fleck, uh, as you all might have known, he departed um, roughly back in May. And it's been a bit of a blur since then. I'm still kind of covering my stocks, which is mining, which I've done for a long time at Morningstar. Um, I used to cover them at Aspect Huntley back in the day and then um, have been with Morningstar since they took over the company. I think it was 2005, six. So been covering um a lot of these companies for for a long time all right and i think it's it's a good it's good just given on what what giving given what's going on right now it's, it'll be interesting to talk about some of the miners um but let's just do a quick introduction for angus so for those of you that listen to the podcast shawnee talked about angus and angus's new daughter matilda so that's his claim to fame um, being on the podcast, basically, I guess. But what, what do you do during your, your day job? Yeah, when I'm not being mentioned on a, a podcast. Uh, so I'm an analyst here. I've been um, in the equity research team since 2017. I cover a pretty diverse range of companies. I don't want to say Matt doesn't do a lot of work, but obviously do work harder. Um, so the, my companies can broadly be considered consumer. So this ranges from uh, airlines to gaming, automotive to food. All right, great. Thanks, Angus. So I'll go through a couple of questions, send through what you guys have. I think we do need to start with you, Matt. So we've obviously seen a couple of things happen. Obviously, you know, the market has, uh, there's been some volatility lately. Some of this is off the back of what's happening in China. There's some fears about the property development market there. We've seen iron ore come down pretty significantly uh, after we've seen great results, right? So just back in August, we saw great results from a lot of the miners. We just went under 100 bucks today for iron ore per ton, obviously. So, Matt, I guess in general, how does all of this tie together? China, the iron ore price, what's happening? Yeah, so <clears throat> I think it's kind of been a long time coming. Um, yeah, the iron ore price has been in rarefied air for some time. Um, you know, anyone who thought two hundred and thirty dollars was was anything near reality was um, was kind of kidding themselves. So, yeah, prices have been well above the cost curve for for a while. Um, China stimulated post COVID, and their steel consumption went up. China's already an outlier in terms of steel consumption, but they've continued to push that you know infrastructure and property development um, lever to deliver GDP growth. Um, but, you know, we've argued for some time that, you know, the peak of urbanization has passed, right? Like there's obviously still gonna be a lot of people urbanizing in China, which creates demand for a uh, new floor space, but it's going to be less than what we've had. And the growth rate is what matters rather than the the absolute, because it's at the margin that the that uh, demand is, is set. Um, you know, and the, and the same with infrastructure. So it seems like, you know, there's been this assumption that China can just continue to to borrow and that they'll just keep playing this game, but it had to stop at some point. I'm not saying it's necessarily stopped now, 
but we've definitely seen some of the heat come out of um, iron ore. And even if you look at 90 bucks a ton, that is still a fantastic price. You know, when, you know, the likes of BHP and Rio are kind of all in costs in the 20 to $30 a ton range, they're still making fantastic margins at 90, 90 bucks. So don't, don't think that this is bargain basement prices because it isn't. And what do you, I mean, I guess if we if we look at this and we have had a couple of questions come through already, we did see sort of large dividends get paid out. Um, obviously, you know, I guess we'll say if Iron Wars at 230 and you're saying 90 is a good price for them, that's all gravy for those uh, for those miners. A lot of that has been returned to shareholders. I mean, what, what do you see, I guess, from a dividend standpoint going forward and, you know, how they'll sort of settle into this lower price if it lasts? Yeah, so I think... You know, we we have to run the numbers again, but I think, you know, probably looking at our our March update, sorry, March April update when we looked at the coverage, that's roughly where iron ore prices are back to. So if people want to refer back to our our report in, uh, I think it was probably in the second week of April, um, where we looked at the fair value for the iron ore miners, that's probably not a bad um, place to to look in terms of, you know, if if prices stay around this level what kind of fair values would expect. Perhaps a bit lower than that, given that uh, at that point in time, the miners were pretty flush with cash and a good chunk of that has been paid out. And, you, you know, normally you, you wouldn't make an adjustment to fair value based on dividends, but, you know, like, for example, Fortescue, the, you know, it was well more than 10% of our fair value estimate. So I don't think investors should think about these stocks as, as dividend payers, you know, um, the, the key driver of, of total shareholder returns is going to be commodity prices and the level of earnings and um, capital appreciation, right? Capital, the, the, the capital component is likely to be the, the largest driver. We've been in an unusual period where commodity prices have been really high and companies have not been spending on capital expenditure and they've been returning that uh you know, those, those funds to shareholders. But I wouldn't expect that that's a, a normal situation. And, it, and it ha it's been unusual in in my time of covering resources in, in, in 20 years, even though it's gone on for a little while. Okay. So we'll get back to the miners, of course. But why don't we go over to you, Angus? So once again, not to, not to focus on China, but one of the uh, companies in your coverage universe is A2 Milk, which is very popular with retail investors. So we've also seen a lot of volatility, I guess, in the share price in general, but it also it backing off based once again on China and some changes there. So why don't we start with A2 and we can get a couple of the problem stocks that you cover. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, so A2 has been having a rough time. Um, its earnings result in August was, was pretty rough, but it wasn't unexpected. Um, the main concern... I will just note, so a lot of the visibility of A2 here in Australia is fresh milk, um, which uh, it's probably better viewed as a Chinese infant formula business. The vast majority of A2's earnings are derived from uh, infant formula, which gets sold either directly or indirectly to China. And the main concern uh, in the near term is the persistently high levels of uh, the high inventory levels of English label infant formula through the sales channel. And so that's, uh, that's really stifled reordering from a lot of their key corporate DIGO partners. Um, and so this, is, uh, this has led to um, aging of product in these sales channels as well. And so A2 has actually written off a lot of this aging product rather than to allow for discounting to maintain its premium perception. And, and while this has had a bit of a hit to earnings in the near term, um, we, we do think that's a, that's a good move. So A2 has a narrow economic moat, uh, which is underpinned by the strength of its brand. A2 is first and foremost a brand business. Uh, we think it still has plenty of brand equity in China, and we don't think the inventory uh, issues are from a weakness in end user demand as much as it is from just an overexcited sell-in. Okay, great. And we do have Jane does say congratulations, Angus. So I assume yeah. Jane is Thanks, referring Jane. to Matilda. Uh, and not uh, and not your coverage of A2, but you never know. Uh, let's uh, let's talk to let's talk about another company that's having some problems. I'm down in Barangaroo, so of course they have built this beautiful new building right next to us, uh, which obviously would be empty no matter what now. But 
Crown Casino. So they were supposed to open a casino. They obviously have not gotten the sign off from New South Wales. All sorts of different stuff going on with their board, with potential bidders. What's going on with Crown? Yeah, so Crown, Crown are facing uh, simultaneous Royal Commissions in both Victoria and Western Australia. And they've got a, a long drawn out process to, uh, to prove suitability in New South Wales. Um, the, the, their result was really overshadowed by, by this sort of uncertainty that we've got at the moment. Um, but we, we do think um, these sort of current unknowns present a bit of an opportunity for investors. So shares in Crown at, at last trade yesterday, anyway, at yesterday's closing price at an 18% discount to our fair value estimate. So that does provide a, a reasonable margin of safety. We, we expect Crown will continue to operate in Melbourne and Perth and ultimately prove suitability in New South Wales. Uh, did, did you want me to go into um, what, what's what's happening in the 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 board changes there, Mark? Yeah, yeah, go for it. Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, the board, so as a, the annual report in 2020, there were 11 directors. Um, uh, the annual report in 2021, two of those remain. Um, and, and then that's in addition to um, some sort of key management positions that have been um, uh, changed. So uh, company CEO uh, Ken Barton was replaced by Steve McCann and the Crown Melbourne CEO was replaced as well. And, and we think that's, uh, that's, that's a big step towards proving suitability in these jurisdictions. We don't have a good idea. <clears throat> we haven't got... Um, uh, a well-defined idea of what suitability is going to look like in Victoria and Western Australia, but the path to suitability is really well-defined in New South Wales. So the Burgeon inquiry was handed down in February, um, and 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 it looks like Crown are following the steps to appease the regulators um, in that jurisdiction. We, we think those steps will flow to the interstate regulators as well. Okay, great. And so quickly, I'm getting a note that there's a lot of people watching on Instagram. So this is on Instagram Live as well. If you send through any questions there, they'll be relayed to me. So you can do that. So to keep going, Angus, on Crown. So we have a question from Gary saying, is Star benefiting from Crown's problem? Um, obviously, a little bit of a weird time because they're not directly benefiting right now because they're closed. But yeah, any benefit you see to Star, either near term or long term? Yeah, no, not not really. Um, so, so the problem with... Uh, but the problem casinos are, are facing at the moment is, um, and it's it's broadly similar across um, across both Crown and Star and, and um, New Zealand listed Sky City, which is um, uh, their core property is the Auckland property. They also have a property in Adelaide and a, and a couple of smaller properties in New Zealand. Um, so the the outlook here, the the pandemic uh, is really wreaking havoc on the entire industry. So. The main floor gaming is um, is significantly impacted by these uh, closures when we lock down. We look at Sydney and Melbourne at the moment, right? And interstate border restrictions and social distancing and capacity constraints are are really limiting their upside when they are allowed to operate. Star hasn't really enjoyed um, much much benefit from Crown not being opened because they've not really been um, able to operate at full capacity anyway. Uh, we, we, we do see, um, you know, maybe some benefit in the near term uh, while Crown is still proving suitability, um, but, but it's minor at, um, it's minor at best. Okay, great. So let's do one more question for you, Angus, on what we've talked about so far. We'll go back to Matt after that. Mm -hmm. But we have a question from Stan talking about A2 Milk. Mm -hmm. And he's saying, is it impacted by the English labeled inventory why not simply change the labels to a language applicable to a customer country? So I don't know. Yeah, what yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a funny business model. So um, A2 have uh, just been selling formula uh, to any channel that will buy it. And a lot of that just turned out to be uh, selling English label formula in Australia and it just eventually going through reseller channels to China. They do have a Chinese label business um, and, and this business has got really good um uh, really good brand health. And this, this is part of the reason why we're confident that the A2 brand in China uh, is still strong. Um, so market share in Chinese infant label formula uh, in, in what are known uh, particularly as mother and baby stores in China 
Uh, it's at around two and a half percent as at June 2021 versus around two percent in June 2020. So they're still growing share in that in that business. They they are in slightly different markets. The Chinese label business is uh, is more expensive at retail, so uh, they do have a slightly different um, target market. But they're both on the uh, the very upper end, ultra premium side of things, um, and, and and that is that is a um, an option that I think they are probably going to be pursuing as well. The China label business uh, is much more consistent. Uh, A2 have a strategy day next month in October, and, and that's really what they're going to be looking at and how they're going to approach the Chinese market moving forward, whether they're going to just allow everything to be sold in whatever channel will buy it, or whether they're going to specifically target a certain market. And I think they're going to be targeting that Chinese label market moving forward. All right. So thank you, Angus. So Matt, we'll go back to you, you know, just to break things up, go from baby formula back to iron ore, since mm -hmm. uh, people are pretty interested in that. So we've got a question from Stephen, and he's talking about uh, Deterra royalties mm. um, and looking at Fortescue. So he's saying Fortescue, you get a lot of commentary about Fortescue being the most leveraged iron ore prices. What about Deterra? Um, are they a potential M&A target for bigger players? So anything you'd like to say about that? Yeah, so Deterra is a really weird asset, right? And it's probably got more in keeping with a, a toll road than an iron ore mining company. It, it just happens that instead of sending cars down a, a, a freeway it is, or a motorway, it is, um, you know, it is sending iron ore and it's getting a percentage of the value of that, right? So uh, th there is a, a fluctuation based on the iron ore price, but it is a very different asset, right? It's got, it's got no financial leverage, basically, and no operating leverage. So what does that mean? So with Fortescue, you know, if, if the if the iron ore price falls, it, it uh, meaningfully cut into their margin because they're because they're a relatively high cost producer. It 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 is not the same with um, you know it, with uh, with Deterra. So you know if if the iron ore price falls by ten percent, um, you know Deterra's Deterra's revenue and profit basically one and the same, almost the one and the same, fall, fall by roughly the same amount. Whereas for Fortescue, you know, from, if it fell by ten percent from here, it'd, it'd probably reduce profit by you know fifteen to twenty, just off the top of my head. So there's a lot more operating leverage, and the closer you get to, um, you know, Fortescue's cost, right? So if the iron ore price is, is sixty dollars a ton then there's a lot more operating leverage at that point because their their costs make up a greater proportion of that of that price so that's kind of how that works and Fortescue doesn't have any any um, you know financial leverage really anymore um, you know they've basically got i think they've even got net cash these days so so that that element you know, which was really particularly risky back in 2013-14, that, that element's been taken off the table, but they still are, once you add back the product discounts at the, the, the high end of the, uh, the highest half of the cost curve, at least. Okay, and we've got, we've got another question about Forrest from Colin. So he's saying, is hydrogen going to influence at all the price of Forrest yeah, it's really early days and, and hard to say at this point, but it is an entirely new business. And the question is, what's, you know, what's Fortescue going to bring to that? And there's a lot of other energy companies that are moving in this space as well. So I think it's early days. Um, they, they, they should have enough money to, to put towards this new business. Um, and I think it's important that they do, right? If you look, if you look really long-term, um, you know, Fortescue is potentially um, impacted by in a, in a carbon constrained world because they're producing, you know, 57% iron ore versus close to 62 for Rio Tinto and BHP and, and Vale's, you know, 64, 65. So what that means is you need more coal um, because there isn't another way to make steel from iron ore you need more coal for every unit of steel that you produce so if if the steel makers are constrained on a carbon side then you may see discounts uh, grow for Fortescue's iron ore 
beyond what they have typically uh, been in the past. So that is a that is a, a risk. Okay. And then one more about Deterra. So Kerry's asking, um, do you think the share price of Deterra will decrease further? So it sounds like very based on iron ore. But she's saying, what is the chance of a capital raising in the near future? Uh, well, I think they would only raise capital if they had something to buy. Um, and uh, you know, our mining assets have been pretty expensive. I, I didn't really answer the question before about is Deterra a takeover target. The, the answer to that is is not not from one of the miners, right? Like a royalty company, because it is such so much lower risk and more and more in keeping with like a toll road, um, a more of a passive sort of asset um, that attracts a lower discount rate. Right. So, so f for, you know, if BHP or Rio Tinto or someone like that was to, to buy it, it would be earnings decretive because, you know, the return, the return on that asset would be much lower than everything they've already got. Okay, great. And then one, uh, one question that, you know, I think over the last couple of weeks, we've heard a lot about is what's going on with BHP and obviously ending their listing over in the UK. We've talked a lot about how they're gonna make up obviously a bigger percentage of the ASX 200 once they move over. But yeah, any thoughts on any thoughts on that? Is there anything, I guess, as an Australian investor that you need to be aware of? So the shares are still, you know, th this is all subject to a shareholder vote too, by the way. So there's still material to come out on, on this. Uh, so currently there are two separate companies, right? And, and the, the shares are not fungible between each exchange, right? So if you buy a, a limited share, that's it's tradable here. If you buy a PLC share, it's tradable in, in London. And there's a difference between the price, right? And the price difference reflects, um, you know, Australian investors are prepared to pay more because they get the benefit of the franking credit. Uh, if, um, if if the the DLC is collapsed, which looks like it's probably possibly and possibly or probably going to happen, then it will mean everyone gets franking credits, not just the uh, the limited uh, shareholders. So there is potential for uh, you know some some leakage of that. BHP thinks that it has efficient earnings and franking credit balance from the Australian assets such that it's going to be able to continue to pay fully frank dividends for the foreseeable future. Um, I expect that'll be a, an important focus of the, um, you know, of the, the material once BHP puts it out. So shareholders will want to know that that's the case, right? Um, and I think that's part of the reason why We've seen, you know, I think that gap before before BHP announced it was looking to collapse, in terms of the 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 price the price discount of premium was roughly twenty percent, um, with limited trading at a high level in the PLC shares, and that that has come down quite a lot since, and I think that's part of the reason why. Okay, great. All right, we'll give you a, we'll give you a breather, Matt. We'll go back to you, Angus, but I'm sure we'll be back on the miners in a second. So Angus, we've got a couple of questions about UMG, so United Malt Group. Okay. What's what's going on there? Um, you know, I think there's been some problems lately, but what's your what's your outlook? Uh, yeah, so so lately they they sort of came out with um, two two one offs. Uh, first was uh, inventory provisions, which is related to uh, one of their grain storage um, contractors in the UK. I think entered administration, um, and also bad debt provisions for uh, for a customer in Asia. Um, and, and so the so uh, as a sort of follow on from what's happening in Asia, they're they're seeing slower um, replenishment cycles in Asia as uh, renewed lock uh, outbreaks and lockdowns in the region is really weighing on customer demand, and um, and uh, in addition to uh, container freight shipping costs, uh, which is uh, sort of across the board as well. Um, and and those costs are being uh, transferred through to the customer as well. So it's it's um, they're seeing limited demand in in Asia as that's happening there. And uh, I'll just sort of explain uh, UMG's United Malt. They um, they they create malt. Uh, a lot of it just goes to make beer. 
COVID-19 restrictions on out-of-home venues is leading, um, is offsetting um, a lot of out-of-home consumption. So a consumption at pubs or uh, breweries or, or what have you. And so this plays into the hands of the bigger players um, at the expense of the craft brewers. So craft brewers are a much higher margin customer for United Malt. They're, they're around a third of United Malt's revenue, but um, more than half of earnings. So that's, it's fairly significant. Um, and when sort of COVID-19 lockdowns are, are happening, it's, um, it, it's got a negative mix shift for them. Um, now that said, the, the impact of the recent update was immaterial to our fair value estimate. Um, we, we expect uh, sort of the longer term as restrictions moderate um, from vaccination rollouts, the, the longer term estimates, uh, we, we didn't change. Um, you, there, there, was a, there was a positive in the, in the update as well that I think was probably a little bit overlooked. So uh, lower restrictions um, and high vaccination rates in the UK and the US um, has really, um, uh, in addition to the, the Northern Hemisphere summer, uh, has really sort of uh, increased, boosted out of home consumptions in those um, breweries and pubs, which has led to a really strong, um, is leading to a really strong second half for United Malt. Okay. And then to switch from beer to funerals, Hmm. Invocare. So for a while, Invocare has obviously gone through a number of different things. So we've obviously had restrictions on funeral sizes sort of throughout COVID-19. I know that death rate, ironically enough, has actually gone down, correct? Just given everyone's hiding in their house. Um, what's, what's going on with Invocare? Is there anything around sort of the current restrictions we have, at least in New South Wales and Victoria, that change in any way your fair value estimate or your view of the stock? Or yeah. what, I guess, overall, what do you think? Yeah, well, we really like Invocare. It's, it's one of few companies in Australia we assign a wide economic mode. Uh, and this is underpinned by its well-known, highly respected portfolio of brands and cost advantages over a long tail of smaller competitors in, in what is a highly fragmented market. Um, and and you, you did call out the sort of headwinds they're having here in the pandemic. And that's, uh, that's on two fronts. So firstly, on, on volume, uh, deaths in Australia are down. So our handling of the pandemic meant that social distancing lockdowns, people just washing their hands has led to a virtually non-existent flu season in 2020. Uh, and it looks like we're probably not going to have a flu season in 2021 either. Um, in addition to that, pricing has been hit. So government restrictions on funeral attendance has meant that uh, funeral providers like Invocare uh, have been unable to offer their, their full range of services. So, um, demand for premium brands like White Lady has declined in favour of uh, lower cost services with maybe streaming capabilities. Um, but we're still pretty positive on the, the company. Death care isn't dead. So we, we're expecting Invocare to continue to dominate the uh, Australian death care industry and benefit from favourable uh, industry dynamics, which is Australia's growing and ageing population. You know, you had a couple of real gems in there. Death care isn't dead. And then, of course, referring to deaths as volume. So that was, yep. that was good. It must be fun to cover a funeral operator. Yeah, yeah. One of the most lighthearted companies you can cover, I think. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. All right. Um, let's, uh, let's talk one more with you. So we do, have a, uh, we do have a question from Kerry. And once again, a little bit China-related. Treasury Wines. Mm -hmm. and sort of where you see where you see treasury wines and obviously you know there's been all sorts of um trade related issues that have come up between australia and china it doesn't look like with the subs deal that is going away um yeah what's your thought on what's your thought on treasury wines yeah so tre treasury wines their um their chinese business was uh, was really hit uh late last year by the implementation of tariffs um which Chinese um, government put tariffs of 170 something percent, a huge tariff on uh, specifically Australian wines. It, it virtually closed the Chinese market for, for treasury. And instead of trying to um, sort of position themselves in a way that, you know, maybe these tariffs will roll off and we can re-enter, they've, they've effectively, effectively just written off the Chinese market and they're, they're looking to um, redistribute uh, into other markets. And they've they've uh, they've broadly managed to do this so far. Um, so this is 
other markets in Asia and also the US is sort of where they're, they're really targeting growth now. And sorry, Mark, what was the question? Oh, no, that was, that was basically that was, the question. Okay, yeah, sure. just what, uh, yeah, what is, what's going on in Treasury and yeah, sort of your viewpoint. So I think we, uh, I think we got that. So Matt, your break's over. Now you can go and break Angus. See, this is, this is good for both of you. Um, so I know, uh, Matt, you obviously, you don't cover Woodside. Um, that's covered by another one of our analysts named Mark. So obviously I like his name. But what's going on with sort of the BHP Woodside? I guess we have a couple of questions, just sort of, I guess, what you think in general about that whole, uh, that whole deal, and then sort of technically how it actually works if you're a BHP shareholder. Yeah, so <clears throat> yeah, from a BHP shareholder point of view, it's not a big deal. It's a pretty small component of you know the total BHP fair value estimate. So really, BHP is is predominantly iron ore with a bit of copper and a bit of coking coal, and that's that's about it. So um, I think what what we have seen with the global miners is. Really, with the exception of Glencore, which has still been happy to purchase and, and have thermal coal be a, a big part of its business, which, by the way, is like on fire at the moment from an earnings point of view. Um, you know, there, there's, there's been pressure brought to bear on both, you know, like Rio Tinto, BHP, Anglo-American to really hive off um, fossil fuels, right? And, and BHP's retained and I think they will retain um, the vast bulk of their coking coal assets. I think we need to really think about coking coal differently from um, from thermal coal because there is no substitute for making making steel from from iron ore yet. So that's just something we're gonna have to live with and, and, and abate. Um, yeah, so back on the petroleum deal itself, it's not a not a massive deal for BHP. You know, Woodside has a lot of untapped potential. There is there are synergies between the um, the ground that uh, that BHP and 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 Woodside own. So bringing them together, you know, there's there's definitely some some logic there. Um, in terms of having a base of earnings. That allows Woodside to do more. I think that that's potentially there too. Right, the bigger company will be able to be in a better position to capitalise on some of uh, on some of uh, Woodside's untapped um, resources, which they've yet to develop. So I think that's probably been what's held back Woodside a little bit. Is is it's just you know these projects have been there for a while and they haven't really. You know, since Pluto, there hasn't been a, a lot of new stuff, um, but there's definitely a lot of potential there. And and bringing in BHP's cash flows, I mean, that makes it much more digestible for Woodside to undertake some of this stuff. Yeah, and then and then Matt, we, we do have a comment, so I'm putting you a little bit on the spot now because I'm not sure if you you've heard of this, but we do have a comment from Mark saying in Sweden, a company called H2 Green Steel is planning to build a fossil mm -hmm. fuel free steel plant by 2024. Um, so that yep. I guess would be eliminating the coking coal. Any any idea what that is and, and what's going on there? Yeah, so there's a few players looking at hydrogen steel. Like from what I've read so far, um, it it is vastly more expensive. So I'm not sure of the scale of this particular plant, but I think um, it's going to be a, a while before this is kind of developed at at scale. Okay, great. Um, and then just overall, uh, we have a question from Joan, um, probably just trying to think overall about the economy here in Australia. How much does iron ore prices influence the Australian GDP? Now, I know that's a little bit out of outside of just looking at at individual companies. But you know, given sort of the pretty big fall that we've had, um, do we think there's going to be any sort of general GDP impacts and impacts to the overall economy? I think the biggest impact will probably be um, royalty and taxation income, both the, the federal government and particularly the West Australian government. So um, the Western Australians have, appear to have been quite separate from the rest of the country. That 
wind might turn around and come back the other the other way i don't have the the number off the top of my head of how important iron ore is it's definitely our biggest export um exports roughly i would guess 20 percent of 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 gdp um so uh if you give me a, a minute i'll i'll chase it up yeah yeah no absolutely but yeah, and then we've got we've got some more we've got some more mining questions for you after yep, that. Yep. Um, let's see what else. So let's go back to you, Angus. Well, Matt looks that up. So um, one thing, obviously, we talk about sort of the reopening trade, and we've seen a lot of kind of talk about the reopening trade. And obviously, one thing that we're all missing out now is going anywhere. Um, so you do cover the airlines, Angus. I guess any thoughts about that? Um, you know, it seems it seems like literally since the first COVID restrictions started last year, everyone has been looking at travel related companies, airlines, and getting ready for the reopening, which hasn't occurred yet. Mm -hmm. What are, What are your thoughts? What are sort of viewpoint on on airlines at this point? Uh, yeah, so I cover Qantas and Air New Zealand. Um, they're the the situation facing airlines and these companies in particular probably doesn't need a lot of introduction. Um, so uh, global air travel was obviously devastated by the pandemic and uh, Australia and New Zealand's uh, approach to close international borders over the last 18 months means that the recovery here significantly trails most of the world. Um, with Qantas, this is offset a little bit by its, um, by its highly profitable domestic business. Um, and New Zealand's a much smaller company and uh, sorry, much smaller country and its domestic business is much smaller. So it's much more reliant on the international business. Um, but, it, but even then with ongoing outbreaks, lockdowns, um, Sydney and Melbourne, the international border, the internal border restrictions uh, when there's not lockdowns means that the near term outlook for, for both these airlines is, is bleak. We, we're expecting full year losses for both companies in 2022. Um, but we do maintain these as short-term issues. So like you said, it's a reopening trade. The recovery of air trade will prove highly volatile. We're expecting international capacity not to recover to pre-COVID levels, so 2019 levels until 2024. Um, and we think both companies have uh, have substantial headroom to, to sort of ride out the near-term turbulence um, and, and are well positioned for when, um, for when the skies do reopen. Um, so uh, just on just on uh, whether these are opportunities, so Qantas is trading at about our fair value estimate at the moment. Uh, Air New Zealand is trading at a bit of a discount, um, although we are expecting them to make a, a capital raise in uh, early calendar 2022 and um, how that's structured may or may not dilute current shareholders. Um, but there is potential valuation upside. So should pent up demand and the, the vaccine rollout lead to a quicker recovery in international flying than we're expecting. Okay. What, one takeaway so far from this is obviously we looked at the fact that you cover a lot more companies than Matt, but you're also doing a lot better on the pun category with the near-term turbulence in Qantas share price. So yeah, something to think about, Matt. We only have 22 minutes left. I think Angus is up three to zero on puns so far, but- Puns aren't funny. <laughs> well, there we go. Uh -oh. Agree to disagree. <laughs> Pun, puns are just a found object. They're just, they're just, they already existed. They're in the dictionary. You just found it. Wow. All right. Well, let's, uh, why don't we keep this sort of inner analyst rivalry behind the curtain <laughs> here. But, uh, but one more, one more question for you, Angus. Yep. Um, so a question a little more specific about A2 milk. Mm -hmm. um, and the question is, do you know whether the revenue from product sales in China is increasing year on year? Because there, and the question says that there isn't a lot of visibility with all these product write-offs. So is that something you're able to see um, just from a product sales perspective? And this is a question from Brian. Um, yeah, uh, the, the Chinese label business is increasing um, uh, in dollar value year on year. The English label business is not. Um, but but a lot of that is the uh, the lack of the lack of visibility isn't so much in in what they've written off. Um, A A two know what they're selling, um, but they don't necessarily know what the um, what what the uh, their resellers are selling, which is where they came into this problem, right? With the the reseller channels um, having a bit too much in inventory, which means they probably sold a bit too 
too much to them um, earlier. Uh, in answer to your question, um, we we expect they will continue to grow uh, in dollar in dollar terms uh, from here. Uh, that that's despite uh, a falling birth rate in China. We're expecting them to continue to capture market share in China. Yeah, Eddie, and we do have we do have a question about potentially A2 Milk being a takeover target, or so specifically mentioning Nestle. I don't know any viewpoints there. Anything that uh, that people should be aware of? Um, look, look, I, I don't I don't want to speculate on on whether they're a takeover target, but but we think they're significantly undervalued, and, and we think they've got a really good brand brand proposition uh, in China. Um, is that attractive for an investor? Or is that attractive for uh, a company like Nestle to take them over? Possibly. Well, the question okay. for those guys is probably how does a, the A2 brand sit alongside all of its other brands, right? Because mm -hmm. A, A2's market itself in a pretty kind of unique way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, and Nestle have um, introduced their own uh, A2 milk formula uh product in China as well, which really speaks to uh, how successful A2 has been to this point. Yeah, great. All right, maybe just a general question that either one of you can, can jump into. So from Lisa, Lisa is one of our favorite webinar attendees. She has three alpacas um, that she periodically sends me pictures of. But overall, if we take a look at what's going on in China, so, you know, there's a lot of different things happening. Obviously, you know, there was a bit of a crackdown on particularly technology companies. There was an article in the journal today saying that this is actually more widespread and a little bit of a attack on sort of the Western style capitalism that has grown up there. We've had iron ore, you know, prices going down based on what's going on with the property developers. I guess overall, just in the stocks in your coverage universe, we've touched on a couple of China issues, sort of how do you see China and how does Morningstar look at China and incorporate that into our individual, um, our individual coverage? I can, uh, I can go first, Angus. I can see oh, you yeah. looking super keen. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so it's a, it's a big question. I, I think, you know, for, for us, the biggest touch point for China is obviously commodities. Um, iron ore being the biggest one, roughly three quarters of um, global iron ore exports wind up in China. So China is the iron ore export market, basically. Um, you know, so we need to look at where does that iron ore go and predominantly it goes into... Um, you know, real estate, property development and, and infrastructure. And then we need to look at, well, how does what China's spending on real estate and, and, and property and, uh, and infrastructure compare to the rest of the world and, and how developed are those assets, right? And in our view, those assets are pretty well developed now. And if you look at infrastructure per capita, it's basically in line with Western world levels, that yet their spending is still much higher. Um, so that is something that we've called out for, for some time now. And, and, you know, perhaps it's unwinding now. But I think what you can say is that, you know, iron ore price above 100 bucks is, is pretty rarefied air. And you can see based on the returns that returns on invested capital, I think, BH, I think Rio Tinto was over um a hundred percent um annualized in the first half you know that that is like <laughs> returns like a google or something like that for what is a very very uh heavy intensive um, capital intensive business right so making a dollar on every dollar invested out of iron ore a year is is just phenomenal and i don't think there's any way it can kind of continue so that's kind of how we think about um you know, uh, fitting China into to commodities. But then other commodities are different, right? Like if you take uh, coking coal, it's not really a China story. Thermal coal is not really a China story. Most of the coal from, well, the coal from Australia is not going to China, but, um, you know, if you take thermal coal, it's, you know, 60% of global export demand is is from um Asia X China, only 20% is China. So it kind of depends on what commodity it is as to how, how much exposure it has. And commodities that are more exposed to consumption, you know, like lithium would be an example of that. Um, we're much more positive on those commodities rather than the ones that are going into investment where China spending is, is really outsized. Okay. 
So talking about coal, stick on the coal, we do have a question from Barbara about Whitehaven. So, and maybe, maybe in this answer, we, we, you could incorporate a little bit of ESG. We do, we do have a lot of questions that have come out about ESG and sort of what the impact would be, regardless yeah. of whatever your own social values are, but the impact on, I guess, supply and demand of security prices as more yeah. people turn to ESG. So maybe something on Whitehaven and then throw in some ESG. Well, I think some of these um, outcomes will be counterintuitive and there are second order effects which are happening, right? So if, you're, if your mental model is coal equals bad, then that's not necessarily going to lead you to the answer, right? There are many different types of coals. Um, the, white, the coal that Whitehaven exports is some of the highest quality in the world, right? So the, the power stations that are new or the power stations that are being built to, you know, replace old power stations are more efficient and they demand higher quality coal. So I've really seen really strong demand post COVID um, for those higher quality coals, lower quality coals, the price has, has improved, but a lot of low quality coal has been taken out of the market, right? So that's from Indonesia and Colombia and, you know, the, the, um, the energy value from that coal. So the amount of energy you get out of, out of burning it is, is much less than, um, than for, you know, someone like Whitehaven's coal. And there is a really, really long tail of that to, to chew through before you start getting into the Australian coal. So if you look at it the other way, if you just say, look, Whitehaven, you should stop producing coal tomorrow global emissions would likely go up rather than down, right? Because that, that coal that Whitehaven um, produces would be replaced by something else, which would more, like, more than likely be, be dirtier than that. Um, how this kind of transition plays out really depends. Is this going to be supply driven or demand driven, right? There's no doubt that we're heading down. Um, that's not necessarily bad for the coal miners if they've got long life. Um, it's increasingly difficult to get new coal mines approved. Um, I don't think it's a particularly sexy place to be wanting to put um, to put capital. So you could see a scenario um, where this is a little bit like cigarette companies, you know, 10, 20 years ago, where you couldn't market the stuff anymore and one of their big costs dropped away and and um, they had some kind of level of pricing power. I mean, it's not exactly the same because it's a consumption product versus a commodity, but you know, if supply is, is limited and, and Australia has got the high quality coal that's more likely to be in demand um, and these companies are not spending on developing new mines, um, then, then you know, the, the cash is going to go back to shareholders. Right. All right. Any viewpoint? So I know, uh, actually, I guess I don't know. So I will not make that assumption. Any viewpoint in gold? We're getting a, a number of different questions on gold. Um, you know, I think obviously with some of the volatility, people maybe see it as a safe haven. Do we have a, a view on, on gold prices? We've talked about a lot of other commodities. Now, gold isn't necessarily a commodity because it doesn't have any use but uh but yeah anything about gold well it, it is kind of it is kind of consumed right like so typically most of it goes into jewelry um the last you know couple of years at least have been a bit odd in that uh it's predominantly gone into investment i think jewelry's had a bit of a rebound this year um yeah i i think it's been interesting. I mean, the gold price at eighteen hundred bucks US is a is a pretty good gold price. Yet, yeah, you, know, you look at the share price of Newcrest, and it's it's not really on fire. So, um, yeah, I think there's actually some some value there. I mean, if you if you just look at the price, I think the price is probably a touch on the high side, but but that doesn't seem to be factored into the um, you know the price of Newcrest, for example. So, um, I think there's actually a bit of value there. Okay. And uh, just a compliment for you, Matt, not from me, but, you know, from David. David said that you are the first person, Matt, who has rightfully explained coal in the correct context. So that's good. And okay. David also had that DHP <laughs> is, well, it's good. To, it's nice to get a compliment, right? And yeah, David yeah. also says BHP is performing I, research. I'm not sure if I'd be so bold. 
Okay, well. That's the hey. it's that I'm right, but that's kind of what, what I'm thinking. Yeah, carry on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, David's also saying that BHP are performing more of a comment, are performing research into decarbonizing steel. So yeah. same thing, trying to remove coking coal. So yeah, I guess a lot of research, but sounds like for you pretty early days and still very Yeah, expensive. Yeah, and I, I mean, BHP was probably one of the first to recognize downstream emissions like you take Fortescue right and and they're talking about being carbon neutral in 2030 okay you know for for if you look at the whole chain right carbon emissions from the whole chain from like iron ore and coca coal in the ground to producing steel that you know the mining of the iron ore and the emissions that come from that and even from you know shipping it to China is like roughly one percent of the total emissions, so nearly all of the emissions are in the blast furnace, when the when the the the, the coal and the iron ore are put together and and, and smelted, um, and you know in that sense, um, you know that that doesn't play play potentially doesn't play to Fortescue, like if you've got carbon capture and storage, that's probably the you know the easiest path to abating those emissions i think i think it's probably the most likely way but uh you know carbon from from steel making is is going to be one of the more difficult and expensive um you know types of carbon emissions to to abate okay great and then maybe just a and obviously either one of you can can answer this um just kind of a, a general question we had um, saying on the vast majority of our analyst reports, um, look at capital allocation, the rating of standard is given. Mm. And just a general question, is there certain stocks where you think the quality of capital allocation decisions for a company is exemplary, which is our, which is our top rating? And the other question is looking at these what are the different things that come into play when you're looking at capital allocation um, and would gender diversity and things like that come into play at all? Or you're, you're purely looking at sort of returns. Yeah. So I don't know if there's anything under your coverage universe. It's hard obviously to figure out what is, or to know off the top of your head, what's exemplary outside of your coverage universe, but yeah. Any on that? So, uh, so I've 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 got Deterra and Aluka as exemplary. I think that's from my list. So I guess you know with with capital allocation, we really boiled it down to, and you see just a a, a vast range of approaches in the market, right? Some are looking at remuneration, some are looking at governance factors, and you really just see a broad spread of of how that's approached. So w what we wanted to do was break it down into three simple buckets and what we settled on were um, balance sheet investment and shareholder distributions and those are the three things that we kind of measure when we think about capital allocation so why do we choose those three because they're they're the most important three when it comes to total shareholder returns and this is our way of looking at uh, and evaluating management through a value lens so you know, balance sheet is the company rolling the dice or not? Are they, have they got a solid balance sheet? But it's really just a gate. You know, once that once the company has an appropriate balance sheet, then it's, you know, do we think they're investing well? What does that mean? Are they investing in the competitive advantage of the business? So qualitatively, it's the right strategy. Are they adding value when they invest? So for every dollar that they invest, they're generating more than a dollar of value. That, or are they running, um, you know, crazy risks like a Vale, you know, with the with tailing stamps? So that was obviously something that impacted them and had an impact on value. And then distribution. So are shareholders getting the appropriate amount? So those are the kind of lenses that we we look at. So if I take, um, you know, if I take, uh, we were talking about Deterra before. So, you know, so Deterra, it's still early days as a listed company, um, but, you know, the, the people that are involved have come from a background of, of you know, West Farmers Aluka style of investing. So counter-cyclical, a disciplined, uh, I think that's appropriate. So from an investing point of view, while we don't have markers along the road, I think the strategy that they've laid out seems appropriate. And 
to, I think, based on what I know, I think they're, it's reasonable to assume that they're likely to deliver on that. And then their distribution policy is 100%. I mean, this is basically like a toll road that pays out its earnings. So in my, in my view, for, for a business like this, that's entirely appropriate. So that's why I've got an exemplary rating on that one. But, you know, if we look across the board, I think I think in, in ANZ, we've probably got... Uh, looks like we've got about 40 exemplary, exemplary ratings out of kind of well, roughly 190. So we do have we do have more and and than than just a handful. And I guess what drives that? So you know, it depends. What's more important? Is it a company that's investing? You know, if they're investing, then we want to see that they're doing that well, and that's likely to be the driver of the exemplary rating. Or if it's a more mature company and it's kind of in runoff, then you know the the uh, the distributions are more likely to be important. The the bigger part of total shareholder returns, and that would hold sway. So, all right, great, thanks. So, Angus, we'll go back to you. We have another question on Invocare. Okay, and then we'll do one last one with you, Matt, and I think we'll be done for the day. Um, so, Derek is asking Invocare, what is the strategy under their new CEO? Are they continuing with this protect and grow strategy that they've been working on for a while, right? Which is redoing a lot of the a lot of the funeral homes, trying to take some cost out of this as well. Yeah, sort of where where are they going from a strategic standpoint? Yeah, the strategy hasn't changed a great deal under the new CEO yet. It is still relatively early days. Um, the protect and grow strategy uh, was uh, so part of that was um, refurbishment uh, of a lot of their the properties that were um, that, that they'd acquired a lot of properties and they hadn't actually uh, invested in those um, to some extent. So um, what what we're expecting is um, an increase in in death rate over the next sort of uh, decade and beyond. Uh, and Invocare really wanted to get ahead of that and refurbish their properties to make them more attractive. Um, that's that's been broadly finished now. There, there's um, maybe a couple of properties left, but um, yeah, that that's that's broadly done. Um, and uh, so, what was the the second part of that question, Mark? Yeah, I mean, I think I think that was the main one. But you know, I, I think I remember from your your research report on Invocare, you do expect to see margins go up because they they're going to stop investing, obviously, in this in this strategy. So yeah, is this this sort of beneficial to shareholders now that? It finished this program and hopefully, obviously, things open up and people are back at funerals. I think that's a good thing for them, but it is for Invocare. It, it is for Invocare. Yeah. And, and as part of that strategy, there was a lot of disruption. So while uh, locations were either closed or, or just unattractive as they're being refurbished, um, that, that did mean that Invocare uh, was uh, uh, on an organic basis, maybe losing a little bit of share. Uh, but as these properties are all, all open, we expect it to um, to build back up again. Okay, great. All right. So I think we're going to call it right there. So you're lucky, Matt. Angus kind of ran out the clock there. But, uh, but I'll thank you. I'm getting a lot of thank yous on the screen as well for you guys. Uh, oh, yeah, thank you for a very resourceful meeting. So that's something you could have. That's a pun you could have come up with, Matt. But, uh, but anyway, thank you guys for doing this and thank you everyone for joining. I'll be back on Thursday. I don't remember what I'm talking about, but one o'clock and then we'll do one Thursday night as well. So anyway, thanks Angus and Matt. Hope you guys have a great rest of the day as well as everyone who joined. Thanks everyone. Thanks everyone. Any advice in this video is general advice prepared by Morningstar without reference to your financial objectives, situation or needs. You should consider the advice in light of these matters and any relevant product disclosure statement before making any decision to invest.